let's start with the basis of student ministry. And here's what you get in Cowboy Church sometimes, is you get a lot of people willing, a lot of willing hands with not a broad base of knowledge, okay? And so they just want to jump in and start doing things. Before you jump in and start doing things, pray. Everything you need to do as a ministry team needs to be based in a time of prayer. You need to have prayed through anything you think God might be wanting you to do to make sure that you're going the direction he wants you to do. Don't ever, ever leave prayer out of this mix. Why on earth would we even have student ministry? Well, let me share with you a couple of things. When you have unchurched people that start coming to your church, this is their mindset. I need to send the kids to their class so that I can learn. I need it quiet. I don't need five kids around me. I had five kids. That's why I use that number. That I don't need five kids around me distracting me. I need to learn, and I can't learn if they're sitting here, and I'm having to pass out smarties so they won't be climbing over the seats. So make sure that you remember that it is far more than child care. They won't know that, but you need to know that, okay? This is not child care. This is teaching, teaching at its finest. That's how we evangelize. That's how we disciple. That's how we mentor. That's how we bond with these kids. It's through the children's ministry. Our ultimate goal is to grow these kids in Christ so that we are growing the leaders for our church in the future and networking them with others so that they all have a network when they get grown. And they won't be like Connie, who had no network when she got started, which is a whole other story. There are two types of cost in children's ministry, student ministry in general. Okay, one of those costs is financial. How much budget money do you have coming in, and how much budget money are you going to pull out? The other cost is people. And if you're not really careful, that's the cost that it will be hard to regroup. Because if you overuse your people, if you overuse your people, they will burn out. And then one day they will come in and they'll say, I'm done. And they really mean I'm done. They're not just done with student ministry. They're done, period, done, burnt, fried. They're out the church and you may never see them again, and no other church may see them or benefit from the wealth of knowledge they have. Don't burn your people out. And there are some ways around that. We start by building a team. Cowboy Church, we're team-driven. That team is going to take care of the entire range of student ministry or children's ministry and youth ministry, depending on how your church is set up. When you build that team, there needs to be intentional team development. And when I say that, what I mean is, your team isn't all teachers. It should never be all teachers, ever. Yes, teachers are a part of the team, and yes, they're vital. Don't mishear what I'm saying. But your team needs some other people on there too. Your team needs an organizer or two. On our team, that's more my role. I teach, I fill in when they need a teacher if, because they know they can come grab me three minutes before class starts and say, we need you to teach. And with the exception of the toddler class, the infant class, any other class I'm really good at. But with those, I promise that the children will live and that we'll get them back to their parents safely. And that's the only thing I'm promising. I'm not, I'm not a primary teacher in our church. But I'm part of the team, and I help organize, and I help plan ahead, and I have valuable input because I have a long history in this. You also need, sometimes you need disciplinarians. And I will tell you many times, especially with children's ministry, the best way to get a man involved 
is to tell him, I just need you to come in here and stand like this. Because, you know, sometimes they don't mind doing that. Don't tell them they might have to pick up a pair of scissors and help a five-year-old cut something. Don't tell them they're going to have to be monitoring the colors. Just tell them, I just need you to be a disciplinarian. Just come in there and stand. Sometimes that, that is plenty to prevent the issue you might have. Several years ago, I had two sets of twin boys, like two twin boys and two more twin boys, all in the same class. You cannot even imagine the chaos that brought to that classroom. Because not only did we have four boys, and we had probably 15 total, but four of them were those boys that were brothers that there's this natural agitation that went on all the time. I needed a man to just come in there and stand quietly. And amazing what difference that will make in your class. Once you have prayed through who might be a good fit for your team and started really seeking out some people to build this team, there needs to be a process to become a part of your team. I'm going to walk through a process. It is not a set in stone process, but it does contain things you need to consider. First of all, your process needs to be in writing. It doesn't have to be a legal document. You don't have to get people to notarize it, but it does need to be in writing. What is the process for adding someone? There needs to be a piece of paperwork that crosses the potential person's line of sight that gives the team permission or the church permission to run a background check. There need to be some references. And it's okay to call references, even if you already know that person. I called references on my sister one time. Just saying. Not because I didn't trust that she was doing what she was supposed to be doing and she would be a good fit. I knew there wasn't anything in her background. But you can't let one person not do something and everybody else do it differently. So I ran a background check on her. Well, I didn't personally. That's another thing. You don't need to personally be running those background checks. Somebody in authority in your church needs to be the one running them. You don't need to see those background checks. Don't be nosy. It's not your business. All you need to know is they passed the background check. They're good to roll. And yes, there have been two occasions in my however many years I've been doing ministry, there have been two occasions where an elder would come to me after a background check was run and say, we need to encourage this particular person to seek another area of ministry in which to serve. You don't have to tell me why. I'm good enough to know that my elder didn't think that was a good fit for our ministry area. So that's what we did. We didn't use them. That person needs to sit down and have, for lack of a better term, an interview with the team that, that you're considering joining your team. That interview process serves a dual purpose. First of all, you need to know their salvation story. The last thing you want is someone teaching your children that might not be saved. It's okay to ask them to share their testimony. You can do that in a way that is not intimidating at all. Many times, if I'm part of that process, I will share my testimony first and then ask for theirs back. That way, it doesn't, they don't feel like they're put in the hot seat. I've already shared mine. They're comfortable, okay? But you need to make sure they're saved. The other thing that it takes care of is making sure that their doctrine lines up. Many years ago, my, my own children were in a class. We got out of church. I always asked my kids, and now I ask my grandkids when they ride with me, what would you learn today? Which usually is a springboard for me to teach them something else, by the way. What would you learn today? And so one of my daughters said, well, Mom, I thought once you were saved, you were always saved. And I said, baby, you are. Once we accept Christ in our heart, 
That's, all, that's the only thing required for salvation. And she said, well, Miss So-and-so said that you can lose it. I'm like, that was because Connie was stupid and we were not vetting our teacher's doctrine. There is a reason I tell you this. I, everything I tell you will be because Connie made a stupid decision at some point and didn't think something through. So I've learned a lot of hard lessons. You don't have to learn those hard lessons. Learn some new ones and then tell me what you learned. Don't learn the same ones I've already learned. You need to make sure that the person teaching those children is teaching the same way that the preacher that's filling the pulpit in your church preaches. If their doctrine doesn't line up, if they're not willing to sway on their doctrine, they're not in the right church home to begin with, and they sure don't need to be teaching the children in that home. Once you have vetted the person, gone through the process, then there's some training involved. And training does not have to be some formal, everybody come up here on a Saturday and we're going to stay 8 to 4 and we've got these classes. It's just not, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? Training can be very informal. It can be as easy as, first of all, they need to go through a child protection training. That's a little series of videos, four little videos. And it just gives them common sense things. Think about these things from the common sense aspect of how we keep our kids safe. Not only how we keep our kids safe, how we keep our adults safe, okay? Some things that, that you should know, those are things that keep you safe. For example, don't ever drive off with one child, just you and one child by yourself, unless that child is related to you. I don't care how, I don't care how good a friend you are. And I can tell you on two different occasions, I had to step in and tell someone with much more authority than I had that they needed to make other arrangements. One time, I drove a child home from camp so that her male sponsor wouldn't have to because I wanted to protect him. And I took somebody with me, by the way. Not one-on-one, -on -one, not ever. Not with nobody, with a child that doesn't belong to you personally. Um, make sure, as you're training, that there's some informal classroom tra training. An easy way to do this is, if you've got somebody ready, poised and ready to help, is to let her go into a class where a teacher is already teaching that's a solid teacher. And then, let her observe for a couple of times. In fact, the last one we added to ours, we let her observe in several different ages so she could decide where she liked the best, what age she likes working with the best. Then give her an opportunity to teach the class with the teacher still there. Don't just walk out the door and abandon her, say, good luck with that. That's not the way this works. You hang around and then you give them feedback and this is what I'm gonna tell you about feedback. When you're giving feedback, please give them positive first, then a negative, and then another positive. They don't want to know what they did wrong. They need to hear first the thing they did best. And then it's much easier to address the thing they might not have done as well. Make sure that it's always positive. But make sure you cover the negative. Does that make sense? And then, after they've taught with somebody looking over their shoulder and helping them a little bit, you'll know when they're ready to tackle it all on their own. Let them have time in a classroom. It's okay to step outside the classroom. If you're glued to your classroom, it's okay to step outside and say, somebody else can take this and run with it for a while. They may not do it exactly the way you do it. I've said this at least three times today already. They may not do things exactly the way you do things, but if it's effective in its own way, let them run what works for them. I would never, never tell somebody, when you're doing a children's ministry session for me, you've got to follow this outline, you've got to say exactly what I say. That's not important. The importance is that we get the same concept across, same way in a classroom. 
you do need to have some way to keep up with incidents. You can do that a couple of different ways. You can keep a little notebook handy that's this happened, this happened, this happened. Or you can make sure you address it when you meet as a team and all the team shares, here's what happened, blah, 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 blah. So there are multiple people that know. That way, three weeks later when mom finally hears what Junior did and she comes and you've already forgotten whatever it was Junior did, you at least have, oh yes, this comes to mind. Another thing is, you need a policy set up that says, this is how we're gonna handle this, you know? As a team, how are you gonna handle it? You need some goals. You need to set some goals as a team. You need to be able to define them and measure them. You cannot have goals that are not defined and measured. Does that mean that's all you're striving for? Absolutely not. It just means that you need some goals that are definable and measurable. You need some short-term goals, less than a year. You need some long-term goals, three to five years down the road. What does this ministry look like in three years? And then watch God blow away everything just out of the water. So great. You've got, I, everyone should have a budget to work from. And I will tell you, I've been in churches where the budget is very, very small. And I've been in churches that um, had a very generous budget for children's ministry. The first time, the very first time that um, I was asked to lead a team, a children's team, they had not had one in the past, and there was zero budget. And then two other teams volunteered to give up a portion of theirs so that we could at least buy some things. When you're planning your budget, and you need to have the opportunity to sit down as a team and plan how your budget money will be used and what you need for the next year at the end of the year. Let's talk about classroom environment. Felicia, I'm sorry, I'm fixing to put you on the spot. Best thing you can ever do and the hardest thing you will ever do in children's ministry is to ask an unbiased person that has never been into your ministry area to walk into your ministry area and look around and give you some feedback. And I did that one time, and I had someone walk into a classroom, look around, and say, I would never let my child stay here. Because it was cluttered. And it was just, it was just look, honestly, there were boxes along the wall. There were totes lining up one wall. There were this, that, and the other. It did not look like this, so nice and organized. And Make sure your ministry area is a place where people would want their children to spend time. Go in and look and have someone go in with you that will be brutally honest and try not to cry when they leave. Or maybe yours is all really good. Um, make sure there are some signs that tell people where to go, how to get there, or people that you know will make sure they know where to go. In our church, when the, we don't release, we release our kids after a couple of worship songs. So they're in for the first part of worship, then they go to class. Every church does this a little bit differently. But when we release, there's always one or two extra people that walk out there to make sure the little babies made it where they're supposed to go, get them settled, and then they come back in. When a new family shows up, there are several of us that introduce ourselves. We even offer to take them out to the classroom so they can look around, so they'll know where their child is going, so the child has a chance to kind of see the environment. Anything you can do like that up front encourages especially younger children to be comfortable. Once they walk in that classroom, that environment, 
you need to have some procedures in place. And it's very, very important with younger ones. They need to know what to expect when they get there. So if you have a procedure and it flows the same way every week, then they're not thrown off, even if a new teacher has to step in. I had the blessing of teaching. I, I've taught with some really phenomenal children's teachers. I do not consider myself a phenomenal teacher. I'll just tell you that right up front. But I have had the, the luxury of teaching alongside some that are. I taught with a kindergarten teacher that this is the way she started her class. Every time you got to play for 10 minutes or whatever it was at the beginning of the class, and then she'd say, okay, we got to gather up by the fire. And she had this little fake fire set in the corner of her room. And you know why they gathered around the fire? Because that's what cowboys did. They would gather around the fire in the evening when they were done with their day's work and swap stories. So we gathered around the fire for whatever Bible study it was that we were doing, for whatever lesson it was. And then she flowed right from there to some activities, a game, whatever, and finished her day off. Oh, and music. She did music for the, because, you know, cowboys sang too. I would have never, never thought to do that. But that made her transition from playtime to learning time seamless. Find those creative people and then put them to work. They will be such a godsend to your ministry area. So next part of procedures. You really need to fill out some forms that tell you how to contact a parent if needed. Sometimes we're really good at that and sometimes we get really lax at that. But it's always good to know how to get in contact. And here's why. Sometimes you may have a child struggling and they're struggling in your class and they're, not, they're miserable and you don't know why. Sometimes a phone call to mom to say, hey, is something going on? Is there some way I can help you, minister to you as a family, be a part of what you're struggling with? Can I pray for you? What can I do to help your family? Because honestly, children's ministry embraces the entire family. So don't miss an opportunity to reach out and love on a family if you see a child struggling. And you can't do that if you don't even know how to contact them other than the 30 minutes you see them, 45 minutes you see them once a week. So the other thing is, um, if you do an event, other than a classroom teaching at this point, if you do an event in the arena, on the grounds, if you take a group of kids somewhere, you need to make sure that you have signed liability releases before you leave or before you start the event. Because if a kid gets hurt, you want to make sure that, that you're covered as far as a church, okay? So make them sign a liability release. There have been a couple of times, well, probably more than a couple, in my course of ministry through camps and children's ministry, there have been a few times I was really glad we had a signed release form. I'll spit it out in a minute. While we're on those classroom procedures, I want you to think about this. There may be a child that passes your room, that sits in your room, that's undergoing abuse somewhere. And when that comes to light, you are required by law to report it. This isn't a, well, they might be telling a story. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. No, if a child tells you something, you are required by law to report it. I don't care if you think it's a good idea or not. I don't care if the parent is your best friend. I care about keeping children safe. And that's our job, to keep them safe. So make sure that you understand that and make sure every person on your team understands that, how important and critical that is. There are a couple of different types of instructional methods that we use in church. One is formal. It's a classroom setting. The other is informal. 
And that's more along the lines of when you gather them up for an event or you have um, arena time one Wednesday or you do something that's totally, and then your teaching time is more unstructured. So it needs to be somebody that will get their attention and keep their attention while they're, okay? Don't, teaching is not something you can put in a box. Don't put it in a box. Don't, don't assume that just because the class lasts for 45 minutes on Sunday and 45 minutes on Wednesday that that's the only time you're teaching because I promise you, if you're anywhere around those kids at any time, you're teaching something of, of some description to them. Before class, if you're working with little ones, you need to have them something lined up so that when they walk in the door, there's something for them to do. I've seen teachers use color sheets. I've seen teachers use puzzles, building blocks, games, a rope and dummy, um, music. That's up to you. But do something so there needs to be that trigger there. Okay? This is before class, this is class. There needs to be that knowing where the boundaries are. Curriculum options. I know people that just want to, I'm just going to use the Bible. Okay. I know people that say, oh, I can find everything I need on the Internet. Okay. But let me tell you where the flaw is. First of all, if you dig it off the internet, how biblically solid is it? And who is vetting all that material you're pulling down? Somebody needs to be vetting it before you stand in front of a class and start teaching it. The other part is, how, if you're not, as someone with a teaching background, scope and sequence is very important, a very important part of what we do. Without a scope and sequence, and all a scope and sequence is, is a plan for how you're going to make sure you teach everything you're supposed to teach from the Bible for the age-appropriate lessons for that child. But without a scope and sequence, there are going to be gaps in what you've taught. There are already plenty of gaps because they only come one time a week, or vice versa. You've already got gaps. We don't need any more gaps. You need a plan. Published curriculum, good published curriculum, fills that gap. And they've already done the research. And they've already created the activities. And they've already got all the plan together where it flows. Yes, it costs money. And yes, it's worth it. So I'll put a plug in here just because I think this is a particularly strong curriculum for children for Sundays is called the Gospel Project. It's by Lifeway. It's one of the best children's curriculum I've ever used. I wish I could find something that amazing for Wednesday nights. We hadn't found that one just yet. Maybe we have. Do your research. Shop carefully. Don't be afraid to buy samples from two or three different kinds as you're digging because it needs to be what you and your teachers are comfortable teaching and the way that they are comfortable teaching. So make sure that you're considering the importance of what you're teaching before you launch in there and say, oh, we'll just use this because it was cheap. I found this at the Dollar Tree on sale. Does the Dollar Tree have sales? No. Okay, I didn't think so. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry, Rabbit Trails. Just, just sorry. Make sure that you're using solid curriculum and make sure that you use it effectively. Make sure your teachers know how to use it. It may take a little extra time to make sure they know, but that's okay. How much time do I have left? Anybody? Is it, is it three? I, no, I don't think. Yeah. 
You're not mathing today? Okay, don't teach math then. Okay. I'm really teasing Peyton. Yeah, that's okay. You just have to measure that. Um, curriculum. Back to curriculum. Make sure you're comfortable with it. Make sure you know how to use it. Make sure your teachers know how to use it. Another thing while I'm on the teacher bandwagon is when we talk about that burning out our people, okay, there are ways around burning your people out. Be creative with what you're doing with your people. It's okay to rotate people in and out. It's okay to have somebody on standby as needed. It's okay to ask about once a year, hey, do you need a break or are you good? And don't be hurt if they say, I need a break. Sometimes they need a break. That's okay. Questions? Yeah, I know. This is what I'm going to tell you first, Peyton. Pray. Before you ever ask the first person, pray. And ask God to show you the person or people that will be a good fit for what you're doing. After you've prayed, and by the way, that is not one three-minute prayer, okay? I mean invest some time in praying. After you've invested some time in praying, then you need to go sit down with that person face-to-face. Do not announce it from the front. That doesn't get you anywhere. Do not put a sign-up table at the back. That's not going to get you anywhere. Go to them, sit down, and say, I'd like to talk to you about something that the God laid on my heart. And then be honest. I have prayed about this. I know that you are called to help us. Would you pray about this as well? Don't say, would you come help? Say, would you pray about this? Pray about it for two weeks. I'll continue to pray. And then at the end of two weeks, can we sit down and talk? And then, if they're really investing in prayer, and you're investing in prayer, I would almost tell you, it's almost a given that they will join you. The other thing that helps you keep people is knowing that there is an end date. If you say, I need help with the second and third grade classroom, you need to say, would you do this for two months? Or would you do this for six months? Or would you commit to a year? There needs to be a commitment period. And then at the end of it, no hard feelings if they step out. Most of the time, what happens is, one of the reasons we have such a hard time getting people is because they're afraid that it is a black hole and they're going to fall off in it and they're never going to claw out. Nobody wants to fall into the black hole and never be able to climb out. So, because of that, they, they don't want to help. They're, they're, uh, no, no, because, you know, I really like to hear the sermon. I really miss the worship music. I really this or that or 79 other reasons that they can't help, okay? It's, but if you, if you say, initially, if you say, hey, would you just commit to two months, a trial period, and let's see how this rolls, then you have a better, better chance of getting them on board. And sometimes in ministry, guys, we've got to stand in the gap until the right person steps in. Always be willing to serve whatever that looks like. Anybody else? Question? No question? You're done. You're fried. Your brain's fried. Mine is fried. <laughs> I'm just going to say. Sweet. All right. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for every child that will benefit from the love that these people in this room share. The reminder, Lord, that Loving you and loving them is what we're called to do. 
And I know that you will bless each of these ministry areas in a special way. I know that even now, someone sitting here is thinking about something they're going to do a little differently. Thank you for speaking. Lord, would you just bless this, every effort that each of these people bring to the table. Watch over them and keep them safe as they journey home. And thank you for this time we've had today. In your son's name, amen. Thank you.